Water. It covers 71% of the Earth's surface and is vital for all known forms of life. Rivers, ponds, and seas of all sizes span across our planet and provide suitable habitats for vertebrates, fish, and marine mammals. Touching the edges of these bodies of water lie our beaches. It is here in this space between the water and sand our marine creatures find life buried among the dunes and rolling waves. It's no secret that animals on land change according to the seasons. In spring, we get a flush of plant growth, a resurgence of animals that are plant eaters, and the following migration of predators into this rich feeding ground. Well, the same thing happens in our oceans, bays, and intertidal marshes. Let's go take a look at some of these fascinating creatures. Horseshoe crabs are marine arthropods that live primarily in shallow ocean waters on soft, sandy, or muddy bottoms, considered the closest relative to the legendary trilobite, horseshoe crabs rank among the most well-known of the living fossils, having remained virtually unchanged for an astonishing 450 million years. June and July is their breeding season. The females crawl up the beach at high tide to lay around 100,000 eggs in a series of batches. Eggs are then eaten by the red knot, a bird which has timed its northern migration to take advantage of all these nutritious eggs. However, in recent years, the horseshoe crab has experienced a decline in population due to habitat destruction and overharvesting. But there is hope for these living fossils. Dr. Tanacredi is a professor of earth and environmental studies at Malloy College and has worked for the past 48 years in various roles in meteorology, environmental analysis, and research ecology. He's been on the forefront of the fight to save horseshoe crabs, both locally and abroad. Some of the characteristics of the prosoma is that they have um, compound eyes, a pair of compound eyes you can see here. They also have um, at least a dozen or so what are called primitive eyes or ocelli and you can just see the remnants of those in the front here and uh, basically these animals because of their reproduction um, they need to have some kind of um, uh, what is called luminosity they have to be able to uh, detect a full moon or a new moon uh, and they are synchronized to the high tides that come ashore but their portion here is a, is a telson you'll see the tail uh, at mm. the end there uh, the telson is not dangerous. This animal is, is, is as safe as can be. Uh, the telson is basically used as a, like a fulcrum. It's, it's to turn itself over if it gets onto the shoreline. This is a male, um, and you can tell that by another physiological characteristics of them that differentiate males and females in that first appendage. Uh, here's a kind of a blow up of that. You can see the male's appendage has this hook and that hook is important in, in um, the reproductive process because the, the hook attaches to the ep, ep, uh, this second portion of the main of the outer carapace and, um, or to the under portion of this in what is called amplexus. From the standpoint of Earth history, they're related to scorpions and spiders as their closest cousins, but the, ancestrally they're related to an animal that predominated the earliest oceans on Earth um, which are the trilobites. And these animals have been around quite some time uh, that they've actually crawled below the, the legs of brontosauruses and they survived uh, five mass extinction events. Critical importance of horseshoe crabs is their blood. If it wasn't for their blood, uh, you and I and anybody who we know, um, in order to test medicines and pharmaceuticals and and make sure that surgical instruments are properly sanitized and uh, do not have any contamination on them, uh, we would be in a lot of trouble. Um, the so their blood is, is, is not red like ours. It's not uh, iron-based uh, like human blood is or mammal blood. 
but it is uh, in fact based on what copper is copper, it, and that correct. makes their blood blue. Correct. Once it hits the air, it, it's blue, and each year, uh, six hundred thousand animals around the world are harvested to bleed, and the, they don't kill the animals, just like us giving um, some blood. For all intents and purposes, this fellow here saves everyone's lives by protecting them and every hospital in the United States has the chemical that's made from Limulus amoebocyte lysate, LAL, and LAL is a $250 million industry each year. And those 600,000 uh, animals uh, um, bled around the world. If that was the only thing that the animals were used for, it probably wouldn't be as big as a conservation issue. But uh, once you use them for bait, they're out of the mark, they're out of the population, and, and they're lost. And that's been the real debate at this point. It's really, when you look at the beaches that support the animals, those have been declining at about 9 to 10% a year. Oh, wow. So give it a decade, 10,000 animals a day in, in Singapore being consumed. The next decade is going to be critical for these animals on the planet. There is another creature who is considered ancient and mysterious, found in every ocean from the surface to the deep sea. Jellyfish might have settled the world's seas as early as 700 million years ago, which makes them the oldest multi-organ organism in the world. Jellyfish are one of the few populations that may be expanding globally as a result of the overfishing of their natural predators. However, there's also some endangered jellyfish species. In fact, there are over 2,000 different types of jellyfish with more than 300,000 different species of jellyfish yet to be discovered. There are two species that we typically see here in North Hempstead, the moon jelly and the lion's mane, which I have right here. While the moon jelly stays fairly small, the lion's mane can grow to be a true giant in the open waters of the Atlantic with some reaching as large as 80 feet. Over the last 50 years, we've noticed an increase in jellies in our waters, mostly because they eat tiny algae and the tiny animals that feed on algae. Nitrogen from fertilizers and septic systems from all around our area also act as fertilizers for the algae in the sea. Huge algae blooms means a proliferation of algae eaters, and that brings a superabundance of jellyfish into our waters. So where's all the things that eat the jellyfish? Well, those would be the sea turtles, dolphins, sunfish, tuna, and many other species. But we all know most of these animals are endangered, threatened, or have declining populations. Town of North Hempstead supervisor Judy Bosworth is one of the people who is working to improve water health and to help save our declining wildlife populations. She's made beach cleanups one of her primary goals. Recently, scientists have done a study and actually have a report card on how the uh, water in the inner Hempstead Harbor is in Long Island Sound. And one of the things they cite is the fact that our waterways have made a remarkable recovery. There's still lots to be done, but the oxygen levels are up. We've actually, um, over the past few years, seeded the floor of the, of the bay with um, clams. And so clams serve as, serve as a filtration for a lot of the pollutants that are in the water. Uh, but now, the New York State DEC has actually declared that the waters are of such good quality now that it's open for harvesting of the clams. So that's, wow. a, that's a real success story. But we're also doing initiatives within the town that residents can take part of. We have a rain barrel program. We are encouraging rain gardens. Um, we have composting. And the idea is to do all the things that we can do so that we're conserving water. And I know that uh, one thing we just keep getting hammered with over and over again in our bays is this nitrogen that's uh, getting out there. We're, uh, we're seeing algae blooms in other parts of, mm -hmm. of Long Island and whatnot. Um, do you guys have some uh, uh, education campaigns we about do. that? We you do. Know, one of the things that, actually we, we did this at the county, uh, you know, when I was a county legislator, um, you should only be fertilizing at certain times. So you don't want to be fertilizing your um, lawns when the ground is still frozen because what happens is there's a rain, all the fertilizer gets washed off, goes into our uh, storm uh, water systems and then out into the water. And we think that is in, in part contributing to the high nitrogen letter, uh, level. So there are things that we can do. There are things that we're looking into. Um, 
you know, there's been improvement. We have a long way to go, but we can only do that really with the help of our residents working together with us to, to make the changes that need to be made. And what can you do to help our marine wildlife? Well, it's simple. Help keep plastic bags and balloons out of our oceans. When floating in the open ocean, they mimic a jellyfish. And all of the animals that I mentioned earlier might accidentally eat the bag or get entangled in it. All right, we're here in the nature studio to take a quick break and look at one of nature's most important processes for marine creatures and all life on Earth, the water cycle. The water cycle is the continuous movement of water on, above, and below the surface of the Earth. The sun, which drives the water cycle, heats water in our oceans and seas. The water then evaporates as water vapor into the air. Air currents move the water vapor around the globe, and cloud particles collide, grow, and fall out of the upper atmospheric layers as precipitation. Some precipitation falls as snow, hail, or sleet, and can accumulate as ice caps and glaciers, which can store frozen water for thousands of years. Most water falls back into the oceans or onto the land as water, though, where the water flows over the ground as surface runoff. Over time, the water returns to the ocean to continue the water cycle all over again. Every now and then, our waters surprise us in new and unusual ways. A pod of beluga whales have been spotted in Manhasset Bay, right here in the town of North Hempstead. This is extremely rare and unusual for these whales to be this far south of the Arctic. The beluga whale, or white whale, is an Arctic and subarctic cetacean. Adapting to life in the ice-dominated Arctic has created unique anatomical and physiological characteristics that differentiate it from other cetaceans. Amongst these are its unmistakable all-white color and the absence of a dorsal fin. Also, belugas have some of the most advanced echolocating abilities of all the whales. Their worldwide population is thought to number only around 150,000, as they've been classified by the IUCN's red list as near threatened. It seems that a small pod of belugas ventured down into the Long Island Sound about every two to three of our human generations. So it's very likely that this will be a once in a lifetime sighting. We're out here looking for the beluga whales. We're just in the area where they've been seen and I can tell we're getting close because I see some other boaters out here. It kind of looks like everyone's looking for them. Everyone's keeping a respectful distance, it looks like, but we haven't seen them surface yet. And what we're going to be looking for is a whitish glow as the whales slowly surface. And then we'll be listening for that characteristic as they exhale and you'll see a plume of, of uh, like mist as they exhale. Oh, oh, I think we're starting to see them. They're just up ahead. There they blow! <laughs> this is amazing, and uh, we haven't seen beluga whales in these waters for, uh, I don't know, maybe a hundred years. So this is very unusual that they would come down out of the Arctic and fish in our waters around here. But obviously, this says something to the health of the sound and the fact that our fish numbers are rising, that these whales are finding enough food here for, uh, to sustain themselves. And it's a small pod of three whales. That would be the smallest that uh, they would travel together. And uh, they're just exploring the bays around here in search of food. Now what's really interesting about these guys, uh, they're toothed whales, so they're predators, but they have adapted to be able to, to uh, exploit any sort of food resource around. So it might be, they might be eating clams, they might be eating fish, um, they might even be eating the jellyfish that are in our waters here. And they have this, uh, they're one of the few whales, they might be the only whale, that their neck vertebrae are not fused. So they can actually turn their head and, uh, and that helps them dig for the clams and things like that that would be down in the mud. But their head, has this big bulbous um, prominence on their forehead, and that's called their melon. And that helps them focus their echolocation so they can channel their sound coming out of their sinuses and through that melon. The beluga whales have taken this to even one step further. They are able to change the shape of their melon 
so that they could either broadcast a wide band or they could narrow it down into a specific sound and direction. In this episode, we've learned all about ancient marine creatures, such as the horseshoe crab and jellyfish. We also got a rare glimpse into a pod of beluga whales and learned about water conservation and beach cleanup. So if you'd like to find out more information about any of the topics we talked about, you can visit me at yc2n.com and watch full episodes of Off the Trail on mynhtv.com. So until next time, I'll see you out there off the trail.